In this podcast, I'm going to address our last two required works, three really when we include the stained glass window from Chartres, but I'll combine this with a review of some of the vast history we've dashed through. This unit covers more than a thousand years. The catacombs date from around 200 CE, while our last work, the Rotkam Pieta, dates from around 1300 CE. Whew. Two of the big college board learning objectives, restated in plain English, are to understand how art changes over time and to recognize influences across cultures and time periods. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about both of these themes as I look at depictions of Christ and of Mary, picking up our last three works in the process. I'll start by talking about how depictions of the central figure in the Christian narrative, Jesus Christ, evolved over the period we're covering in this unit. But first, I want to make a cautionary statement. The Christ of the New Testament and of our Christian faith is a complex and multifaceted individual, teacher, miracle worker, prophet, savior, son of man, and son of God. So when I talk about changing depictions of Christ, I'm talking about changes in the emphasis that different cultures place on different aspects of his character and ministry at different times. So two common early images are Christ as the Good Shepherd, which you see here, sort of, in the Catacomb of Priscilla. I've included two other rather clearer Catacomb Good Shepherd images. You'll note the similarities. Here, and you've seen this before, is a Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital, Ravenna. Note that this comes from pre-Justinian Ravenna, so it would still be labeled early Christian, not Byzantine art. We see a number of Roman influences. The artist depicts a landscape and uses shading to create figures with actual volume, and of course the robes look classical as well. I just note that early Christian art also frequently depicted Christ as a philosopher and teacher. And both Christ the Good Shepherd and Christ the Philosopher are images of Jesus as a younger man. The more powerful but also more disturbing image of Christ crucified, which will become so prominent in later Christian art, is almost unknown in this early period, but this image from the church doors of Santa Sabina is an intriguing exception. You should remember the apse mosaic from San Vitale. It illustrates the transition from early Christian to Byzantine depictions of Christ. Christ is still youthful and beardless, but this is Christ as the ruler of the world, symbolized by the orb he's sitting on. Now, these changes in imagery reflect very important religious and political changes. Christianity is now the official religion of an empire that unites the power of the church and the power of the state. This is Justinian's church, even though he never actually set foot in it, and he is clearly associating the power of Christ with the power of empire. And here we see even more evolution toward Christ Pantocrator, Christ Lord of hosts or ruler of the world. It is probably the most common image of Christ in later Byzantine art. Now, no depiction of Christ is more iconic of Romanesque art than Christ as the final judge of all human beings. His throne signals his power, but this is spiritual power over salvation and damnation, not the imperial temporal power of the Byzantines. So we looked at this last judgment scene from Chartres West Portal in our uh, last class. While this is a transitional work between Romanesque and Gothic, we identified some changes from the Romanesque tympanum at St. Foy. More focus on Christ's majesty, less focus on the perils of hell. Uh, and this is the South Portal of Chartres, not a uh, portal of Chartres, not one of our required works. And a hundred years later, this is the heart of the Gothic period. So again, we see a last judgment. But note that the figures are more interactive and realistic and more reflective of the Christian humanism of the Gothic period, a more approachable Christ, and of course, Mary. Uh, let's move away from sculpture and consider the famous Gothic stained glass of Chartres Cathedral. Here is a nativity scene. Here is Christ's presentation at the temple, uh, and here is Christ's entry into Jerusalem. None of these is a required image, although Chartres Cathedral is, of course, overall a required work. But I think it's interesting that of the 29 images in the bay windows depicting the life of Christ, an astonishing 20 depict his birth, infancy, or childhood. And this tells us something important, again, about the Gothic era. This, to repeat what I just said, is the great age of Christian humanism. And Chartres Christ, at least the one who appears in stained glass, was once a helpless baby, 
and a curious child. This is also an age when the adoration of Mary assumes central importance in the Christian faith. More on that in a moment. But first, finally, I'm going to get to one of today's required works. In the Chartres panel, we saw images of Christ that revealed more of his humanity, but nothing like the emotional horror of the dramatic work on the left, which uh, has the latest date of the required images for this unit. Crucifixions were entering into Christian art during the Gothic period, but the crucified Christ was generally portrayed as a triumphant figure who was overcoming death, not as a man suffering a painful execution. You can see this more triumphalist portrait in the Italian Gothic crucifix on the right. But the Rotgen Pietà presents the crucifixion in all its pain and terror. It also presents Christ's mother, not as the serene mother of God or the tender loving Madonna, but as a woman in agony over the loss of her son. So what's going on here? What's changed in Europe? Well, both the Romanesque and Gothic eras were rather upbeat periods in history. Romanesque churches celebrated, among other things, the realization that the world did not come into an end in the year 1000. The food supply and population were growing, towns were re-emerging, and a self-confident Christendom even set off in the Crusades, admittedly not the church's finest hour. Gothic Europe saw the rise of cities, the establishment of great universities, and again a Christian humanism that celebrated learning and human accomplishment, although always within a Christian perspective. Faith became more triumphant, but it also became more comforting, and again, stay tuned for the new role that Mary was playing in Christianity. The 1300s, that is the 14th century, were another story altogether. Europe was hit by a terrible new wave of bubonic plague, which killed a third of Europe's population, perhaps 20 million people altogether. The Hundred Year War between France and England devastated much of France. The church experienced its Babylonian captivity with rival popes in Avignon and Rome. The Ottoman Turks conquered much of Eastern Europe and actually advanced on Vienna. And finally, this was a century of terrible climate change, in this case global cooling, or what is sometimes known as the Little Ice Age, which produced widespread famine as farms became dramatically less productive and made the people more susceptible to plague. The church and individual Christians responded to this suffering in various ways. The 14th century witnessed a rise of mysticism and a great emphasis on personal devotion. If high Gothic Christendom identified with Christ the innocent baby, Christ the ruler, and Christ the son of Mary, the late Gothic Christ identified with Christ the suffering servant who had experienced our troubles and could help lead us through them. These were the years when Francis of Assisi transformed monasticism by sending monks back to the cities to minister to the poor, and the suffering of Christ and his empathy for suffering humans was central to the Franciscans' very popular preaching. The focus on Christ's humanity and suffering resonated especially strongly in Germany, where intellectual high Gothic humanism had never taken on quite a strong hold anyway. I will see more of these tormented Christs in the art of the Northern Renaissance after Christmas. The term expressionism will return in the 20th century, again used especially to describe German works, so stay tuned. What stylistic devices does the artist use to convey emotion? Well, the paint is faded now, but the torrent of blood would have been a vibrant, dramatic red. The lines of the sculpture are twisted and contorted. The scale is not realistic. Mary is much larger than Christ. And perhaps this signals the way Christ is temporarily diminished in death. I'm going to break here and continue in a second podcast, just so you don't 